are now back and ready to hear uh, our third panel of the day. Um, I will send icy glares to those of you who are not sitting down and being quiet. Okay, great. Um, so over the course of the day, too loud. Thanks. So many different audiences to please. Um, we've talked about the big fish and the little fish, and there's been a, a, a conspicuous emphasis on the, the idea that uh, child soldiers, child pirates, and so forth are at the bottom of a very uh, long and dense chain that goes all the way up to the top to banks and financiers. Uh, and so this panel will help address um, what kind of uh, enforcement mechanisms, what kind of, of uh, methods are out there to go after the people who are really pulling the strings um, from, uh, from banks or from, uh, from other areas who are not out there doing the work of child piracy or child soldiers, um, but are profiting from it. So we have uh, three distinguished panelists and my colleague, Justin McLaris, to uh, start it all off. Thank you. Uh, move the box. We'll call it a new floor. Uh, uh, conference participants, dear colleagues and students, uh, remaining members of the audience. Uh, my name is Juscelino Colares. I'm a professor here, and I'm thrilled to be with you this afternoon to, uh, and to have the chance to introduce uh, uh, your panelists, Yaram uh, Gottlieb, Hugh w Williamson, and my esteemed colleague, uh, Richard Gordon. Uh, first, let me allow you to tell you a bit about how we'll proceed before I introduce uh, each of them to you individually. And, make some, and I would also like to make some brief remarks after uh, my initial comments on how they will um, and who these uh, uh, people are. Uh, Yaron Gottlieb is a senior counsel at the Office of Legal Affairs at Interpol. Uh, he attended law school in both the United States and Israel. Yaron is a member of the New York and Israeli bars and a visiting professor at Université Jean Moulin Law School where he teaches a course on the protection of cultural property under international law. Hugh Williamson uh, is a law professor at Dalhousie uh, University, where he is also lead investigator and manager of their marine piracy project. He's one of the world's most prominent authorities on maritime legal issues dealing with uh, fisheries and ocean management, and of course, piracy. Uh, finally, Richard Gordon is our resident expert on legal matters involving financial sector regulation, money laundering, and terrorist financing. Besides being an accomplished expert in these areas, Richard is a graduate of Harvard Law School, an expert on development, a world traveler, speaker of several languages, and the best cook in the Cleveland area. <laughs> I'd also like to note that, like Giselino, I'm on sabbatical. So I'm now going to remove my tie <laughs> and my, I want you to know that I do own one. just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing that too. I'm on sabbatical too. <laughs> Later. I'll follow your lead, Richard. All right. So, uh, and so we are very finally, uh, we used to work at a firm in DC and we are finally very happy to be working at the same law school. All right, so m to my remarks, very brief ones. Uh, uh, on the allocation of talent, implications for piracy preemption. Uh, when they are free to choose among careers, people choose occupations that offer them the highest returns on their abilities. The ablest member uh, among us tend to choose occupations that exhibit increasing returns to ability, since increasing returns allow superstars to earn extraordinary returns on their talent. LeBron James is infamous in Cleveland. <laughs> I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and join the Miami Heat. Uh, shows that players are willing to forego even direct compensation, he took a pay cut, to grab higher indirect revenues from playing a better team, let alone winning w, uh, you know, NBA titles. I'm not saying anything about the cities though, Miami Beach and Cleveland. Of course, some people have strong comparative advantages uh, uh, from natural talent for particular activities, such as singing, Formula One uh, racing, Ayrton Senna comes to mind, and basketball playing. But others who may not have these great specialized abilities, yet are lucky to grow up in the right environment, possess great intelligence, or are other generally valued uh, traits, can become the best in many occupations. They, be they can become entrepreneurs, government officials, 
speculators, clerics, and of course, pirates. The environment where they grow matters a lot. In different countries and time periods, talented people have chosen occupations in which was, it was the most attractive to be a superstar. When markets in a country are large and the institutions that surround them operate within set rules and efficiently, talented people can easily organize firms and keep their profits by becoming entrepreneurs. This is the case in the United States, Great Britain, Japan, etc. In many other countries, talented people do not become entrepreneurs, but join the government bureaucracy, army, organized religion, and other rent-seeking activities because these sectors offer the highest prizes, or they leave. This is the case in much of Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Europe, up to the 19th century. This is the case in much, uh, in failing states, the vacuum left by the absence of a functioning government, a hierarchical army, and the powerlessness of other institutions induces the most talented, at times, among, uh, among those who have not left to pursue criminal activity. These examples show that talent is often general rather than occupation specific and that its allocation is therefore governed not just by comparative advantage <clears throat> in cultural backgrounds, but also by returns to absolute advantage in different sectors within a given society. Take the United States as an example. The flow of some of the most talented people into the, fi into the financial services industry in the past two decades followed the higher returns this sector had in comparison to other productive sectors. <laughs> Big, you know. The general point remains, talent and leadership will go to activities with the highest private returns, which need not have the highest social returns. There, I managed to, to link pirates to Wall Street financiers in the same speech. <laughs> Thus, if rent seeking and productive entrepreneurship are in fact competing for the very same people who are the ablest in a society, we know piracy, preemption, not just punishment, will require a deep level of cooperation to be accomplished. We will leave this room wiser after we hear what our experts have to say. We'll start with it. Yaron. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for the kind uh, introduction. We have to go through these. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen present here. And also, it takes opportunity to say good morning or good evening, depending on the time zone of those uh, watching us through the webcasting um, of the conference and with the hope that it's working also at the other side of the ocean in France where I come from, uh, then I would assume that the most typical question that I'll have to face at the end of this presentation would come from my uh, dear wife and two daughters currently watching us, hopefully, uh, <laughs> over dinner, uh, which in itself is not very welcome in France. Uh, TV dinners and webcast dinner, let alone, uh, are not very popular there. Um, nonetheless, very glad to be here today and to participate in this very interesting conference. Um, I've already learned a lot from the previous discussions. Uh, my presentation this afternoon uh, will focus on international cooperation and information sharing in combating maritime piracy. And I'll also mention a number of challenges that we are facing uh, in that regard at Interpol. Um, and I'd like to take uh, first a few minutes uh, very shortly to mention uh, a few words about Interpol, uh, really in a nutshell. Uh, since I, I'm here for the first time. Um, Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, was created in 1923, and as of today we have 190 member countries, uh, practically universal membership. Um, our constitution from 1956 provides that Interpol uh, has been created for the purpose of promoting uh, international police cooperation. Uh, therefore, we are an international organization promoting police cooperation. We are not, we are not an international law enforcement agency. Those of you that have eagerly read Da Vinci Code and watched Lord of War and similar <laughs> Hollywood movies, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, it is fiction. Um, it is fiction, but nonetheless, we do provide support to our member countries in police matters. Um, that's what we do, and we do it by uh, developing a number of tools and services, such as the communication networks that connect all our member countries. It's called I-24-7, um, and millions of messages are exchanged each year between police forces around the world. Uh, also in reference, of course, to piracy. We've put in place a number of criminal databases um, such as uh, DNA, fingerprints, uh, and so on. Um, we have a SLTD database that's stolen lost travel document. Uh, 
Uh, one thing in common, by the way, between the Navy and the police is a common use of uh, abbreviation and acronyms. Mm. Uh, we feel very operational when we do that. Uh, whether or not it's the case, it's, it's a different question. And I'll mention only one more um, acronym that we use in Interpol, and that's called an IRT, Incident Response Team. Uh, Interpol does not have executive powers to uh, investigate in national jurisdiction, but upon the request of countries, we do engage in, in a criminal investigation in member countries if you're invited to do so, and we do it by dispatching these IRTs, um, a group of experts that goes to a particular country, and we have done so already a number of times also in the context of maritime piracy. For example, uh, gathering evidence uh, after the release of boats, uh, after the ransom has been paid, and uh, again in collaboration with local police forces. Um, in January 2010, we have created the Maritime Piracy a Task Force, a dedicated task force uh, to address uh, the growing problem of, of uh, growing threat and risk of, of piracy. Um, and as of last year, we have also put in place uh, a database specifically dedicated to maritime piracy. We already have uh, quite a lot of information in this database from our member country. And the main purpose of this database is to identify, uh, to try and have enough information to put together that will assist us to identify the kingpins, all that are uh, ordering and are leading the, the criminal networks um, that lead to the piracy attacks. And we have to bear in mind that in modern piracy, unlike what, what it used to be maybe 200, 300 years ago, uh, those that attack at sea are the low level piracy. And that's why we're talking also about juvenile pirates so often. Uh, 14 years old, 15 years old are sent to sea but those that order uh, and, and lead the groups are at shore, and therefore we're trying to, um, to go after them. Um, and one other thing that we do uh, with uh, this uh, Maritime Piracy Task Force is to provide training and capacity building from member countries, and we should not underestimate the importance of doing so. Um, police around the world, and in particular in some countries in East Africa and West Africa as well, um, they don't have the tools and, so, and, and they don't have uh, the know-how sometimes of what to do with this piracy incident. Uh, we have cases of, of uh, cell phones confiscated from pirates and held uh, by the police, but they didn't know how to expose the SIM card. As simple as that, and how much information can we obtain for this SIM card? That's the type of thing that we do uh, through the capacity building. Um, going back to our constitution, uh, an interesting legal question, since we're here in law school, uh, arose at the very first stages of our engagement in, in uh, combating maritime piracy, and it concerns Article 3 of our Constitution, uh, according to which uh, Interpol must not engage in any activity of political, military, religi religious, or racial character. And the question that we had to address at the Office of Legal Affairs, where I work at Interpol, was can we work and cooperate with the Navy? Can we cooperate with organizations such as NATO, which by the very definition and, and purpose, uh, have some objectives of military um, or political uh, character? And, and we had to assess this question uh, based on our constitution, our understanding of our rules, um, and we uh, implement what we call a functional interpretation of Article 3 of our con uh, constitution, uh, based on which we look at the nature and purpose of the foreseen cooperation. And we said that by the end of the day, we're talking here about cooperation for the purpose of law enforcement. Exchanging information on fingerprints, for example, is not Navy information, it's not military information. It's information that is meant for prosecution later on down the road, and as long as we uh, focus on this type of exchange with the navies, with NATO, with other organization, uh, in such cases, Article 3 is not uh, a legal obstacle for our involvement. And based on that, we gave a green light to a maritime piracy test force to engage in such activity. So that's about Interpol, really in a nutshell. Um, and if you have further question, I'll be very glad to take it later on. Um, and then to move to international cooperation. Now, we all know that uh, the legal framework for uh, Combating privacy is found in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, Article 100 to 107. And most of the discussion so far has been uh, has focused on Article 101, that's the definition of privacy, and the um, operation, so to speak, uh, provision of the privacy section, notably Article 105. And in my opinion, relati relatively less um, um, focus was given uh, to Article 100. And Article 100 of the privacy section provides for the duty to cooperate in the repression of piracy. Um, and I would submit that it's not a coincidence that uh, the privacy section starts with, with this article, with the Article 100. Um, it's a driving force behind the whole privacy section. Uh, it sets a tone 
Um, it's, the only it's the only provision in UNCLOS uh, whose title is the duty to cooperate. It uses the strongest terms that you can find in UNCLOS to the fullest uh, possible extent. Article 100 does not detail the specific obligations, uh, but nonetheless, we are not prevented from reaching some conclusion of this duty to cooperate. And one, one conclusion that I have reached, uh, and there's more discussion in my paper, uh, is that I believe that the standard to be, uh, to be used when we look at Article 100 and when we assess whether states are compliant with obligation under national law is a due diligence principle under international law. And specifically, we need to look uh, into whether states have exercised the best efforts, that is, concerted, uh, sincere, and proactive efforts to uh, combat maritime piracy. I also propose that the substantive provisions, such as Article 105, be interpreted in light of the duty to cooperate in Article 100. Um, there's more in my paper, and if I'm not mistaken, the chairman would be interested in asking me a particular question after that, so I will uh, leave this point for further discussion um, later on. Now, to be clear on that, I'm not, suggesting, I'm not suggesting that we have an absolute duty to cooperate. Of course, it can be qualified in certain instances, um, but by the end of the day, uh, this is a general duty. This is a way we, we need to look um, at international cooperation. And here I would quote uh, Professor Waldform, uh, the former president of the uh, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, who stated that turning a blind eye to the activities of pirates is in itself an act of piracy. In itself an act of piracy. It's a very strong statement. I don't know if you need to go that far, but I believe we can uh, convey this message of the importance to cooperate. The next point concerns um, sharing of information, and again, very briefly, because there's more discussion in my paper. Um, Article 100, as I mentioned, does not specify the specific uh, duties to cooperate, but nonetheless, one which is very clear is a duty to share information. It also derives from other uh, instruments, such as the SUA Convention I mentioned earlier today, uh, Security Council Resolution, and even a uh, decision of the International Court of Justice, such as in the Corporate Channel case, um, the duty to forewarn that's found in this case. Um, in other words, if you have relevant information, share it internationally with other <coughs> states, with international organization. Um, if you wish to impose restrictions such as uh, based on national security, do it on an exceptional basis and not as a standard procedure. Um, so that's very, again, very briefly about the duty uh, to share information uh, and having established the duty to cooperate and the duty to share information. The next point I would like to make is about the nature of cooperation when we talk about combating piracy. Because typically, um, a criminal activity is dealt with by the police, but here we have to recognize the need to integrate other entities. Uh, of course, we have the Navy, we have the shipping industry, we have the police, and we have, of course, the judiciary later on. And that's why I call this type of cooperation, uh, specifically in combating, in, in combating maritime piracy, uh, interdisciplinary cooperation because the various entities come from very different disciplines, again, shipping industry, Navy, and, military and, and the police. Um, and that's a, that's a paradigm that we have to uh, implement in combined maritime piracy. Um, but this is not without difficulties. Uh, for example, if this conference was held here four or five years ago, I would not have been here, most probably, because at the, fir the first response to the piracy of the coast of Somalia was to dispatch the Navy and thinking that that would be enough. And then only later on, um, countries realize there's a missing link between the navies and the prosecution. And that's the role of the law enforcement. Um, that's also why I'm here today. We had other difficulties we still face from time to time because, again, uh, these entities from different disciplines are not used to working together. Uh, just a few examples with the shipping industry. A typical situation would be that after a boat uh, has been hijacked by pirates um, and after it is released, the seafarers, what would be the first thing they would do? The good seafarers. They would clean the boat. That's what they have been educated for for years, which is the right thing to do, except that from a law enforcement standpoint, it's a sheer catastrophe. We're talking about destruction of the crime scene. Not deliberately, but that's the outcome. So we had to sensitize the shipping industry of the importance to contact first uh, the local police or Interpol in some cases uh, in order to, uh, to gather the evidence before the, ship, the boat is, is being cleaned. So simple and yet so important for uh, the purpose of investigation. Um, with the Navy, uh, we had a, a different type of uh, difficulty, and that is the tendency of the Navy to classify every information that it collects in the context of naval uh, operation. Uh, but again, from when we talk about uh, combating piracy, 
it doesn't make sense because this information has to go to the law enforcement uh, community and then, um, of course, to prosecution. So we had to explain to the Navy that it's better not to classify this information in the first place, or if it, it has been classified, it should be declassified so we can use it uh, further on. One last difficulty with regard to sharing of information that I would like to highlight, um, and that's something we continue to face, um, it is the proliferation of inter um, information networks and platforms that are created on the international level, on the regional level, um, to collect information and to circulate it. And the difficulty here that we have is that, first of all, sometimes it's simply a waste of resources. If you already have good structures in place, why create a new net uh, network? But more importantly, most of these networks very often tend to work in closed circuit, in fact, in, in a silo. So there could be a very uh, important information circulating in one, in one network which is not available to the other network, for example, uh, to us at Interpol. And there might be exactly that, might be the, the missing piece that, we are, uh, that we, we are looking for for our, our puzzle to put together to connect the dot which is circulated some, uh, somewhere else. Um, and that's why uh, it is important to identify, if we can, a single information sharing mechanism. And this, in fact, was done by Working Group 5 that's working on, on financial flaws under the uh, auspices of the contact group. Um, and the shipping industry very early on in this Working Group 5 said we need to have one contact point. We, don't, we can't share information with everyone around the world um, and so many networks. And so we have identified this, uh, um, this mechanism, which is, in fact, in fact two layers. Uh, first, we have one contact point in each country and then we have one uh, contact point on the international level, and that has been Interpol for the purpose of uh, the private industry. Um, and so just to conclude on this, uh, on this point, uh, in order to streamline the flow of information, we need to centralize it, centralize it, or alternatively at least to have interconnection between the various networks. Uh, very important for our uh, success. Just to conclude, therefore, on, on uh, the points I, um, I made here, uh, first and foremost, the importance of cooperation and, and sharing of information as a legal duty under international law. As a legal duty, uh, that's my argument. Uh, the shift in the mindset from the traditional paradigm uh, of, combating um, of combating crime to an interdisciplinary uh, cooperation paradigm. And, and finally, um, uh, and here I am, this is the last point just to capture uh, what I would like to convey here. Um, this, uh, this panel is called uh, New Ideas uh, to Fight Piracy. But here I would like to be a bit uh, traditional and say there's no need to reinvent the wheel. First look to existing structures, existing networks, and only if, if you need, uh, create new ones. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will finish my, uh, my comments for today, and thank you for your attention. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, well, good morning, good evening, depending on those who are watching us over the internet. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Michael is not here, but thanks to Michael Sharp of the Case Western University for, first of all, participating in our uh, intersectoral uh, working group on piracy at Dalhousie University last year, and then for extending the, uh, the invitation to be part of their net network uh, here at uh, Case Western as well. Again, uh, as has been emphasized many times, uh, the cooperation and the uh, the fight against piracy is the critical thing. Um, I think it was maybe a bit presumptuous of me to get this idea of new thinking in the fight against piracy, financing and plunder, preempting piracy before prevention becomes necessary. That this is maybe sort of fairly grandiose, but in actual fact, that's one of the areas that we're gonna try and look at, and that is it's easier to stop piracy if you can keep it from actually occurring rather than trying to deal with it after the fact. Uh, my outline, I'm going to look at just very, very briefly the definitional problem. Uh, I have a law degree and an MBA, but I'm going to talk as an MBA today, so <laughs> law students, this is going to be business style, not so much uh, citation and, uh, 
and the legal size, looking at some of the issues and why that has become important in our study a little bit on contemporary piracy. And then I'm going to get into piracy cycle, a business model, indicators model that we've been working at, and identifying some possible outbreaks and a preemptive strategy. So this is going to be looking at the application uh, rather than the, uh, the theory behind it necessarily. Uh, I decided I would consult with an expert on piracy who's been hanging around Halifax for a number of years uh. <laughs> to see if he could tell me what um, financing and uh, plunder were all about. Uh, that's at our Maritime Museum. That's how they used to treat pirates in Halifax 200 years ago uh, on what is a very popular public beach known as Hangman's Beach for obvious reasons. Uh, the financing of piracy, I'm taking a broader view, the financing is the investment in piracy. And that includes human resources, uh, logistic equipment, uh, support bases, everything else, not just the money involved. And the plunder is the economic reward. And it's economic, but it's not necessarily just money. Uh, so we had a problem, and we spent a lot of time going around in circles and iterations. What do we mean by piracy? We all know what piracy was, but if you took the legal definition, you were going to get yourself in a lot of difficulty because you're going to be narrowing your scope too much. So we took a look at a practical, what we call a practical definition. We knew what we wanted to talk about. We wanted to talk about a actual potential, a deliberate criminal act interfering with the rights and freedoms of the seas so that we could incorporate a number of different types of activities, targeting marine crafts and persons. And again, it was for economic gain. And one of the discussions we had, it's the purpose of piracy is for economic gain. The motivation of the individual pirate is not necessarily economic, and that is one of the distinctions that has to be made. Uh, so we got into what is not piracy, and I guess here, uh, what the discussions yesterday destroys my third slide, and that the Ninth Circuit Court apparently disagrees with me that uh, environmental activism is piracy in there. We, we took a look that piracy did not include IU fishing, pirate radio, uh, terrorism, environmental activism, that's the Farley mode, that is the Sea Shepherd Society that they were referring to going out and ramming whaling ships, drug smuggling, slavery, mutiny, and downloading songs from the internet. <laughs> and as I've had to explain a number of times when people call up, I said, is, you know, you deal with uh, music piracy, and I, as I told U.S. Customs coming in, I said, no, I deal with real piracy. If they download in a boat, call me. <laughs> <laughs> if they're on land, it's not my concern. So, what is plunder? Well, piracy evolves, piracy emerges. The, Piracy we've seen around the world is not the same crime in the same area by the same people at the same time. There's a number of different outbreaks, and we'll be looking at that, but what are they after? Well, depending on the pirate gang, you have a number of different objectives. Uh, in Somalia, the model was ships, cargo, and crew for hostage or for ransom. Uh, some places they take the ship and the cargo is booty. They're looking to dispose of the ship and the cargo. Uh, the Straits of Malacca piracy originally was just break and enter on ships. They were after the money in the master's safe and whatever valuables they could take. Some of it was strictly a cargo motivation. Uh, others, for example, in the uh, Caribbean uh, drug-related piracy, they were trying to get yachts for um, ships to use for muling, uh, muling drugs in the United States, or they're trying to get fishing boats to use as mother ships to uh, further activity. So there's a wide variety of different motivations for carrying it out, but the fundamental thing is it's a business. They're in it for profit. They're not in it for political gain or to make a political statement. Now. We were looking at uh, seven, at least seven major piracy outbreaks in the, the last 30 some odd years, scattered around the world. And we didn't focus on Somalia, and we intentionally didn't focus on Somalia. We were looking at the broader scheme of where do, are all these different piracies and what did they involve. And so if you take a look at it, you see that there was a wide variety of different perpetrators in a wide variety of different areas. These were all different. They occurred independently, and they had almost no relation with each other. There might have been some, hey, it's a good idea, maybe we should try it, but there was not the old style of a pirate moving from one area to the other. These are all independent people. Uh, the Caribbean Basin piracy, starting in about the 1970s, tended to be, at that time, hijacking of yachts for um, drug vessels. There is currently a piracy going on on the coast of Guyana involving fishing vessels. You won't find out about it unless you read the Guyanese press, but they actually have a government uh, piracy compensation fund to compensate their fishermen for losses due to what they're calling piracy. It's mostly uh, inshore, so it wouldn't fit the classical legal uncle's definition of piracy, but it's the same type of guys doing the same type of thing in the same kind of water. Gulf of Thailand was the most serious of the modern piracy in terms of human life. Uh, started 1970s with the exodus of the boat people, the ethnic Chinese leaving Vietnam. When you're a refugee, you don't have much. What you have, you've got with you. And so it became an opportunistic crime by Thai fishermen. The fisheries had collapsed. They started going out and attacking these refugee boats. If you've ever seen the boat people, two, 300 people 
on a vessel. It was bloody. Uh, five, six, seven hundred people killed in a year on the, on the bad years. Uh, two, three thousand serious assaults and sexual assaults. It was a very, very serious piracy, but it didn't attack big commercial vessels, so it didn't attract an awful lot of international attention because it was not a major economic consequence. Uh, it was dealt with by, finally by the Thai police going into the villages where the pirates came from and doing some fairly high-level prosecutions. The, the refugee floods stopped, and that essentially decreased the piracy. Straits of Malacca was initially the break and enter on ships. Ships slowing down to go through the straits between Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. Uh, the pirates uh, were sort of local gangs who would hop on board at night, tie up the master, rob the safe, and, and then get off. They weren't interested in the vessel or the cargo. They were just interested in what they could grab. South China Sea was better organized, and there was a tendency to, sometimes it appeared to be a hijack for a specifically targeted vessel. There were a few attacks which were taking cigarette carrying ships out of Hong Kong. There seemed to be collusion involved, but it was something which involved taking a specific cargo or a ship. There's, um, tugs were being taken to be sold on the market, repainted and flagged. So again, different pirates doing different things in a different area, but it's still piracy. Um, West Africa coast, uh, we've been saying, and we've been tracking that one for about three years now. It's making the press in the last three to four months. Two years ago, the local gangs shut down the Nigerian trawler fisheries because they were attacking so many of the trawlers. This did not make the international press and no one was concerned. It was only when they started taking tankers and big vessels that there was an international concern there. So this was one of the things we were looking at. Now, East Africa, Red Sea, Horn of Africa, that one has been fairly well talked about and uh, has been, uh, I, I think, almost, I won't say dissected to death, but it's been very, very well looked at. And that is the one that's made most of the press. Why? Because it's the one that's costing the global economy 12 to uh, 17 billion dollars. Uh, and the Bay of Bengal, and one of the uh, ironic things is Bay of Bengal on the northern side of Indian Ocean, I ha was at a meeting where the IMO and IMB stood up and said there have been no piracy attacks in the Indian Ocean in the last three months. And then I stood up and said there were 50 attacks on small fishing vessels off of Bangladesh last week. <laughs> it made the press when 36 of them were tied up and thrown over the side and drowned. That one got attention. But the fact, and matter of fact, the Bangladesh government got annoyed with me for saying that because they don't want it to be called piracy because they don't want the insurance rates to go up. So there's a lot of piracy out there, but it's quite, quite different. So what we were looking at is what we call the piracy cycle. And the piracy cycle, we said it's a business model, and what happens is by the time you notice it, by the time it makes the press, you'll recognize the business cycle in hindsight. You'll see where it started, but in actual fact, they never pick it up beforehand. It starts off with precursor activities. There are things that are taking place which you can say, here's where we're beginning to see lawlessness begin to take place in the maritime environment. It evolves then into an opportunistic type of piracy. And the opportunistic type of piracy is a fisherman, a smuggler, uh, could be a, even a coast guard. So he's out there on the water being paid to do something else and making his profit. But he comes across an opportunity that's just too good to resist. And so he starts getting involved in making a little bit of extra profit by doing piracy. Now. When he starts realizing that he can make more money in piracy than he can in doing his regular job, then the piracy evolves into an organized business model. And eventually, as the organized business model becomes quite a sophisticated criminal enterprise, it turns into a sophisticated culture room business system, which is when it becomes very, very in firmly entrenched. And you can see a parallel model in the drug trade, where they've gone from uh, you know, some guy carrying a few pounds of uh, whatever in his backpack, up to the fact that now you've got entire uh, countries being ruled by uh, narcotics gangs. And so, in actual fact, we see this. There may actually be a final stage to this that we've been sort of looking at, and the final stage would be the pirate gangs move on to something else. Because either piracy has become too risky and they're not making enough profit. And oddly enough, we're now seeing some reports that some of the Somali pirate gangs are now providing uh, security to some of the illegal fishing activity that's going on in there. So they've gone from you know, basically poacher to game teacher, back to poacher again, and uh, in, a, in a bit of a cycle. But that is uh, essentially the cycle we look at. Now, the piracy business model itself, when we look at it, when you get to become a business, it requires a business model and it requires a lot of logistics to support it. You need food, fuel, storage, you need to recruit and train a crew, you need to get weapons, you need to get uh, a support base, you need to have some kind of uh, a financial transfer system, probably in, in, uh, an informal um, value transfer system, some way to move your money around. You've got to maybe dispose of your cargo. So you require a lot of logistics to do it, and it's a pretty organized activity to run. Now, one of the things that we said is when piracy begins to evolve, when it becomes 
from precursor to opportunistic. You've got a chance to attack the, uh, the activities. When it's shifting from an opportunistic piracy to organized, there's another opportunity because that's their most vulnerable point to begin to look at them. So we looked and said, in the terms of the business model, what are the activities that, w and where could they be the most vulnerable? And the one thing is, which are the obvious crimes? Which are the criminal activities they're doing? Well, obtaining weapons in most places, that's a major criminal activity. Opportunistic piracy tends to be uh, quite often bush knives and machetes, maybe a small pistol or something like that. What pay maybe changed things off Somalia was they had RPGs and AK-47s and assault rifles. They were able to go after big targets because they had big weapons. That one is a requirement of organized crime, similar to what we're seeing in the, the drug gangs now. Uh, the corruption of local officials. Organized crime needs a corruption of the bureaucracy. They've got to be able to operate in an environment that is suitable. And this is one of the strange things that we've seen about piracy. Piracy does better in a weak state than it does in either a strong state or a failed state. In Somalia, it's in Puntland, not Somaliland or Somalia. In Somaliland, the government's too strong, they can suppress it. In Somalia, it's a total basket case. They can't keep the other pirates from stealing their stuff. They can't buy food, they can't get stores, they can't organize things. What they need is a state that's just strong enough give them banks, you know, access to stores, various things to keep the business running, but weak enough that it can't do anything about them. And that is one of the things that we look around for, is where they're likely to basically be able to set up because they've got the infrastructure they need. Now, on the recruiting and training of crew, I talk about criminalize. That's what we think is one of the critical uh, weaknesses, and that's what General Dallaire and the others have talked about. If a third of their human resources are made up of kids, if you can stop them from recruiting the kids in there, and if you can criminalize that activity, you can start making it very expensive and very difficult for the organized piracy to keep its human resources going. If every time they go out on a pirate raid, you take a third of their manpower, especially some of the trained ones, they're going to have a difficulty in keeping going. So the criminalization of the recruitment may be a, a critical thing. And again, transfer and payment of money. When they start getting big money, then they start getting vulnerable. So these are some of the things that we are looking at from the... Uh, the point of view of where can we actually make a, an impact on piracy. Now, what we did is we had some of our people who are in the School of Business and deal with risk management to look at an indicators model. Is there anything you can find out there which may give you a hint that piracy is likely to break out? And so what they did is they came up with a, uh, a model. They said, you've got piracy goes through some stages. You've got no piracy indicators or precursors. Nothing's happening. Then you begin to get precursor events taking place. So that is the period where you might be able to do preemption. A piracy event is one piracy attack. That is when piracy begins to occur, but a piracy outbreak for the uh, statistical analysis was over uh, 20 uh, attacks. So what you had is a number of variables, and what I'll, you can read this in the paper, which we, we reference there, but what we found was piracy outbreaks occur relatively poor countries, high corruption level, low on the human development index, faced with medium and uh, severe socioeconomic impact. But the interesting thing was the one major correlation was uh, the human flight and brain drain significance. We don't know why it's there, but when you get a lot of people moving out, it could be because of the refugees, it could be because that you're losing opportunity for people to have legitimate jobs, but that was one of the indicators, which then leads us to looking at where do we think uh, piracy is at a risk? The purple areas are the ones that already have piracy. Brazil's an interesting an anomaly in there. Uh, it could be because of the, the northern area around Guyana and the problems that they're having there. But when you looked at the, the countries that are at severe risk, of the countries that we had identified, four or five of them since the study have already had severe piracy attacks taking place, including Papua New Guinea, so something may be going on. Now, the serious refugee problems right now, we're looking at Syria. Syria right now is the serious refugee, one, uh, two million refugees. Are they leaving by sea? If they are leaving by sea, you've got human flight by sea. That might be a piracy vulnerability, which nobody, as I can tell right now, is looking at. So what is your preemptive strategy? Preemptive strategy is simply identify likely outbreaks early. If you can spot them early, you might be able to stop uh, opportunistic piracy from taking place. Second thing is work cooperatively, cooperatively with other agencies. Now, what's important there is the tools, as has been said, are already out there. The agencies and the information are already out there. The problem is it's not their problem. And so what happens is you get the stovepiping. Uh, Unclose 101 uh, and 100 say cooperate. That's for states. Try to get the bureaucracies in the states to cooperate among themselves. That's the trick to, to dealing with it. Uh, if you're going to reduce precursor events and aggravating situations, you can probably decrease the outbreaks of piracy, but it's going to require an integrated approach. 
Now, just quickly, I'll go, to go through this. There's a new uh, code for West Africa. If you take a look at what's happened, the Djibouti Code dealt with piracy and armed robbery against ships. The Djibouti Code, or the West African Code, which just came out last month, they've got money laundering, illegal arms trade, crude oil theft, human trafficking. They've got the whole spectrum of maritime security issues that they're going to be dealing with, and that is the integrated approach. So, how to deal with it? My conclusion. Uh, specific anti-piracy actions don't occur until piracy is officially noticed. So the government won't do anything until it's been brought to their attention by a serious attack on a major vessel. Okay? So if you share information, you'll be aware earlier. Okay? You want to preempt organized uh, opportunistic piracy by early intervention. If you can start spotting the, the problems on the water, then you take early action. And by reducing the profitability of the business model, then you prevent opportunistic piracy from becoming organized piracy. And I think that's what's going to happen off Somalia right now. They're now uh, organized, it's dropped back, but if they don't do anything about it, the opportunistic piracy is going to start again because they're still there, they still have the same situations, nothing has changed. So, uh, quickly, that's, uh, you'll see some of the faces around here. This is our team from the uh, uh, Piracy Research Project at Dalhousie University, and I guess questions are later, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. This is going to be a very difficult act to follow. I don't have any slides. As I mentioned, anything that goes wrong today, I blame on the fact that I am currently on sabbatical. So thank you. <clears throat> Except for my throat, which has something to do with the pollen around here in Cleveland. So what I'm going to do, actually, is following um, on Hugh's presentation, is look at one of the vulnerabilities that you noted, which is the profits, the money, to a certain extent, the financing. Um, I'm doing that primarily because that's my field. But um, so as Hugh has just mentioned, um, there are really kind of different types of piracy depending on the objectives of the pirates and on the geographical area in which the piracy occurs. And if you remember looking at one of the slides there, I think it was slide table two, you had that nice uh, matrix showing the different types of piracy, the locations, et cetera. So I'm just going to sum that up to say that sort of the pirates in the East Africa, Red Sea, Indian Ocean area, uh, they tend to grab the ship and its crew in order to ransom them back while as sort of all the other pirates pretty much, they grab the ship, they're looking for the stuff that's on board, they want to keep it, they want to sell it, something along those lines. And from the perspective of looking at finance as a vulnerability, these two types provide kind of different challenges. So um, I would say that the typical East um, African pirate group, the, the folks who are doing the uh, um, seizing uh, ships and crew for ransom, what they would do is, obviously, first they'd grab the ship. Um, they would call the owner. Uh, the owner would typically um, speak to the insurance provider, figure out how much the boat was insured for, and say, we've got to do something about this. The insurance provider would then contact some kind of negotiator. Mm -hmm. I've never been called to do that before, but I'm available if anybody wants to call me. Mm -hmm. um, and then a negotiation would ensue. Um, they agree upon a price. Uh, apparently, prices have gone between one and a half million up to 35 million, although I guess because of the reduction in piracy in this particular part of the world, I'm not quite sure what's happened. This is statistics from um, managed to dig up from 2010 and 2011. Um, and then um, a drop off point typically would be agreed upon. So the insurer would go to its bank and withdraw a whole you know what load of money typically in a mix of $100 bills, $50 bills, and 20s. And then they would drop it off. So then the pirates would get this money, you know, typically an airdrop, and they would keep some of the cash in the jurisdiction, wherever it is, whatever country or nearby countries in which they're located. Um, and they would use some of that cash to live on, uh, to pay off locals that they need to pay off, including government officials and perhaps terrorist organizations that are also active in the area. But if they are in this for a business, as Hugh is, is discussing, and as we've heard earlier today, and they're doing really well, there would be a whole lot of cash left over, a lot more than they could spend in the area. So what are they going to do? Well, they're not going to be able to invest it locally. Some of it may be, but what they want to do is to get it out of that jurisdiction and invest it in some place where they know the returns are going to be good and somebody won't steal it from them, right? 
So good way of doing this is to get it out and get it to a major jurisdiction, a central financial area where perhaps they can deposit it in a bank or where they can buy shares, big houses, perhaps in Mayfair, who knows. Um, how do you get the money out? Well, there are two obvious ways. You can either transfer it out physically or you can move it through the financial system. Now, apparently, at least, uh, again, figures from 2010, there is a suggestion that um, probably about 40% of the ransom uh, in the East African style of, um, of piracy was spirited out of the country in order to invest and also probably to pay off occasionally investors in the piracy operations, at least at the beginning um, of this most recent bout of significant piracy activity there. Um, what about the other types of piracy? Well, as we know, they might seize the boat because they want a boat. They might seize the boat because that's all they have, and then they want to sell the boat, or what we call fencing the boat. That's kind of similar to what petty criminals do, or even, I suppose, uh, less than petty more major criminals. If they steal property that they can't use or don't want to use, they sell it for cash. And then again, if you have cash, either from selling the property because you managed to steal it from the safe, you're stuck with doing exactly what the um, pirates um, who are doing the ransom for money are involved in, which is what do you do with the excess cash you can't use, you spend some of it, and then perhaps you want to get it out of the jurisdiction and uh, in that event get it into a place where you can invest it and where it's safe. So why focus on money? Well, first, criminals have had a long, shall we say, primary interest in cash or its equivalent because it can be moved easily, it can be converted into whatever good of service you want at the moment, and it can be invested and used later. So if criminals like it, you can guarantee that law enforcement is going to like to follow it too. What happens? Well, by doing so, they can perhaps find the perpetrator, perpetrator's confederates. They can use the trail of cash um, and the actual cash that they might seize as evidence in a prosecution. And of course, they might be able to confiscate the cash which is the best of all, right? Because they get to keep the money. Um, and of course, there was nothing like taking away the proceeds of crime when it comes to reducing incentives to commit a crime itself. So not surprisingly, criminals have long tried to hide their cash. And when they can't hide it, to hide their personal connection to it, and even best of all, any suggestion that the origins of this cash are of criminal activity, in other words, proceeds of crime. And the act of doing that is what we all call money laundering, which is one of the crimes that have been uh, um, brought to the fore, particularly in agreements in, in the eastern part of Africa. So I will say, fortunately for those of us who are law-abiding citizens, or maybe for those of us who know a little bit about the rules and might be able to sell our services to not law-abiding citizens, um, over the past 40 years, anti-money laundering rules have become, I think, the most followed global governance standards in the world. The standards were developed and are continuing to be refined pretty much on a yearly basis by this group called the Financial Action Task Force. It's not an international organization. Um, it is a task force. It was originally convened primarily by the US, the UK, and France um, back in the late 1980s. Um, since then, it's brought in the entire OECD and other major jurisdictions with financial centers like India and Russia and China and now South Africa. Um, and they have produced something called the 40 Recommendations on Money Laundering. And since then, it became included terrorism financing and also um, weapons of mass destruction and prolifer proliferation finance, excuse me. And I should say, even though they're called recommendations, they aren't recommendations at all. They are mandatory, which is something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, so where did the anti-money laundering rules come from? As I say, really it was the US bringing this uh, issue to the fore about 35, 40 years ago. So why is this, why did this happen? So basically it had to do with suppressing the drug trade and particularly cannabis, which I get a big kick out of given that it's becoming increasingly legal in the United States, um, but eventually also cocaine, crack and everything you can think of that is uh, illegal narcotics. So um, why do you go after money laundering? Well, number one, as a general rule, um, people pay for narcotics with cash. They tend not to use checks, credit cards, or wire transfers. Um, obviously, the reason, principal reason is that you have records. Records are not good if you're trying to hide your connection to the cash. 
or the possibility that the cash might have criminal origins, that also there might be seized. Um, but also, if you're selling drugs, you don't have to worry about bad checks or you know, stolen credit cards and stuff like that. You know, illegal activity is for the other guy, not for you, I should say. <clears throat> or for you, not for the other guy, I should say. Um, the problem was that um, unlike the cash or cash value realized by sort of petty criminals, folks who steal cars and then fence them, or silverware or computers, um, kind of like during Prohibition days, the returns on uh, illegal narcotics sale or trafficking were really great, right? Tons of cash. So what do you do with all this cash? Well, buying small ticket items might be okay. You know, you go, go to the store and buy something, go to the garage and get your car fixed, maybe even buying a car. But, um, you know, at least in New York and Los Angeles in the 1970s and then later on, if you... Um, you show up to buy a really nice big Ferrari, the kind of things that drug dealers like to own, or a really big house in Bel Air, and you carry big bundles of cash, somebody might notice, right? It looks a little dodgy. And if you try to go in and buy stocks from your stockbroker, they might even drop a dime. Good old expression before there were cell phones. You might even drop a, drop a dime to the FBI. Um, now, why is that? Because in the 1970s, in the United States, in major cities also in, in other developed countries, um, people just weren't using cash like that anymore. Maybe sort of small items again, there could be stores like 7-Elevens that were still taking a lot of cash, but by and large people were using the formal financial system. So I'm gonna take two seconds. Some of you already know about this from me have taken my banking law course, but um, with the exception of weird things like Bitcoin, which I won't go into, um, the formal financial system is the cashless system that is based on banks, okay? So essentially, as countries move toward a for formal financial system, the formal, what we call the payment system, you're effectively withdrawing cash from the economy and replacing it with a system based on, I have a claim against my bank. And instead of transferring cash or gold bars or something, what you're really doing is you're transferring claims among different people against their banks. So just very briefly, you know, if I open up a bank account with cash, I give cash to the bank. What I'm really doing is I am investing in the bank and I'm getting an unsecured claim against the bank, which I can then transfer to somebody else. And people can transfer their claims against their banks to me. So that when I get my paltry um, check from Case Western Reserve University for while well, I'm being on sabbatical, which means I'm on half wages, but that's another issue. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually get cash, right? What happens is that Case Western has a claim against its bank, and it transferred some of that claim to my claim against my bank. That's what happens. So why is this very useful? Why is it better than hauling big bags of cash around? Well, obviously, it's a whole lot more efficient. It's really fast, particularly once you have electronic banking. And it protects those big bags of cash from being stolen by highwaymen, highway women, or of course, pirates as well. So, in order not to stick out in places like New York, London, Paris, and Tokyo, at least back in the 1970s, you need to get your money into the formal financial system. Because if you don't, people are gonna be curious why you're carrying big tons of cash around. So what is the first major anti-money laundering rule, what it is, very obvious it is if somebody shows up with a whole lot of cash and tries to make a deposit into the bank, which is the sole entry into the formal financial system, you tell the bank to put a, fill out a little piece of paper and send it to the government. Somebody's putting a lot of cash in here. And that's, of course, what happened. A $10,000 cash reporting requirement was instituted in the United States, the first major anti-money laundering rule. So if you are a criminal, what are you going to do? <clears throat> 9,999, that gets to be a real pain. Uh, eventually the government says, well, you know, if it's close, you should add this up. What you do is you open up a whole lot of bank accounts for 5,000, right? The only problem is there's only one of you. So you have to start using a lot of assumed names. So what do you think the next rule was? Banks must re are required to identify who you are. You really are, not just show up and open up. I am John Big Booty, John Little Booty, John Tri Booty, or something like that, right? So that was the second step. So 
what's the next thing the bank is going, what, what's the next thing criminals are going to do? They set up not accounts of real persons, but physical persons, but corporations, legal persons. So pretty soon you have ABC Corporation, ABCD, ABCDEFG, et cetera, at different banks. You're avoiding the cash um, reporting requirement. And of course, meanwhile, the government has figured out there are these companies that actually genuinely do, as part of the legitimate business, get a lot of cash. So they've come up with, with um, exceptions to the cash reporting requirement for them that are tied up with this new anti-money laundering rule, which is banks don't have to just identify who you are or identify who the corporate client is, because it's very easy to create any kind of corporation, but they have to figure out what the legitimate activity is of that company. If it's legitimate and we expect you to get all this cash, then it's okay, file no report. If it isn't, you have to file a report. All right, so let's, these standards have since become globalized, pretty much in effect everywhere in the world because if a jurisdiction has not implemented them, then what happens? It means that companies, I should say, financial institutions, banks in jurisdictions that have, meaning the developed world, cannot do business with companies, banks that are located in jurisdictions that have not implemented these rules. So they become pretty much globalized. So how can we use these rules to try to go after pirates uh, in particular as opposed to just drug dealers or other criminals? Well, looking at the um, piracy involving ransoms, you've got to, you have all this cash. You have to either put it in a bank in the local jurisdiction or get it out of the country by courier or by informal means into a bank in a developed country jurisdiction. The problem is that the banks in local jurisdictions often don't implement these anti-money laundering laws because they're difficult to do and they're expensive. So often, if you get the money into those jurisdictions, you still have to get them transferred out to the international financial system so to get it into a jurisdiction like the United States where you can make an investment, put it into a bank there where it's safe, so at that point, you need to get sufficient information either to the, to the extent that the local jurisdiction is enforcing these anti-money laundering rules, to the extent it isn't, and it's going to a place like New York or the United Arab Emirates. Get them enough information so that they know that these cash proceeds are not the proceeds of, illegal, of legal activity, but illegal. And what would be the best way to do that? Well, these insurance companies are withdrawing huge amounts of cash. If they can report this, and it gets around to all the financial institutions in the world, this will really help banks in places like New York, et cetera, to identify transactions from the piracy jurisdiction into accounts in the developed country jurisdiction as coming from ransom. That's my one idea. <laughs> Great uh, uh, interventions from uh, our panelists. I would like to ask a, a brief question to one, uh, to one each, uh, uh, and then later, then I'll open after they answer the, the floor to uh, uh, the audience for Q and A. So, uh, Yaram, uh, in your article, you indicate the current practice of uh, naval forces to hand uh, suspected pirates to regional states face trial uh, has raised some criticism. The practice that uh, Navy of country X apprehends pirates in the ship and then you basically uh, surrender you know, these individuals to be tried safe uh, by the courts of uh, country Y. Unclose article 105, the step of, uh, 105 establishes that quote, on the high seas every state may seize a pirate ship or aircraft and adds that, quote, the courts of the state which carried out the seizure may decide upon the penalties to be imposed, end quote. Critics have uh, interpreted this language to require uh, any apprehended pirates to be tried in the courts of the seizing country. Obviously, this is a clear challenge to the jurisdiction of uh, the Kenyan courts over the Sussex, for, exa for example. 
You and others have rejected this jurisdictional defense with the argument that, quote, the strong duty of cooperation in regard to piracy as articulated in Article 100 would include and, uh, and condone exactly this type of cooperation. While I'm no pirate hugger, I am not sure Article 105's grant of jurisdictional authority to, and I quote, the courts of the state which carried out the seizure can benefit from such a broad interpretation. So two questions. One, aren't jurisdictional statutes generally narrowly interpreted? And two, don't the rule of lenity and the indubio mitius principle require adoption of a narrower interpretation than what you and your sources propose? Thank you for the question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody has read my paper so far. That's a good, that's a good sign. Um, it, it is a very good question. Um, and, and this morning you've heard from one of the panelists uh, very early on saying that the, the law of piracy is revisited by countries, and that's, that's part of it. Uh, we are now in, in, uh, uh, in times where um, national jurisdiction have to address this type of question, uh, and I believe to answer this question, it depends on the overall uh, approach that we take to the piracy section, and whether we want to adopt a broad interpretation or no interpretation. Uh, naturally, uh, naturally, coming from uh, the law enforcement angle, I would, I would advocate for the broad one, but that also corresponds to um, the overarching principle um, of, of uh, UNCLOS, which is to uh, ensure the freedom of navigation on the high seas. And we've seen this type of question not only with regard to Article 105 and the question of transfer, we've seen this with regard to the definition of piracy, ecoterrorism, the discussions that uh, we had yesterday and the Hugh raised a question on this. Um, Article 101C, still with the question of the definition of piracy, um, does it cover online piracy? Not so all of these questions, there's a main question we ask ourselves, should we adopt a general and a broad interpretation of the piracy section? And I believe the answer should be yes, despite the fact that jurisdiction tend to sometimes uh, approach it from a criminal, from a pure criminal, criminal procedure standpoint um, to uh, adopt a narrow uh, approach. Here we're talking by the end of the day of, uh, of a crime that uh, originates from international law. And we have also to bear in mind the fact that under international laws as a general principle, and all of the law students here I'm sure have learned about it, uh, coming from an old decision of the Permanent Court of, of Justice uh, in another maritime incident between France and Turkey, according to which whatever is not explicitly, explicitly forbidden under international law is allowed for countries. And Article 105 does not forbid the transfer of suspects for the purpose of, uh, of facing trial in a different jurisdiction. So that would be my argument, um, and may or may not be convincing. We'll have to see what national jurisdiction uh, decide on that. Um, and in my uh, paper, by the way, uh, without knowing uh, at the time on the list of speakers, I quoted to support my argument a distinguished speaker that spoke here before, and that's uh, Mr. Roach, uh, and I quoted his, um, his article saying that it is, in his opinion, and in my opinion as well, would be inconsistent um, to argue that Article 105 does not allow the transfer of, of pirates to face trial in a third country, inconsistent with the strong duty to cooperate under Article 100. So I hope this is convincing. We'll see whether the national jurisdiction are convinced by that. Uh, question for you, now. Uh, you uh, page 11 of your uh, piece, you indicate a timeline that illustrates the evolution of the phenomenon of piracy from its absence to its outbreak. Uh, it seems to me that the biggest bang for the buck in terms of piracy prevention, uh, of a piracy prevention strategy, uh, which you call preemption, actually, in your paper, might uh, occur at the stage in which one detects precursor events. Uh, you did go into some of that in your presentation, but uh, could you go into more detail on what these events are, what specifically these events are, and what current efforts uh, uh, by international institutions have been deployed in this particular uh, uh, portion of the, the spectrum? Well, again, looking at the, the kind of precursor events, uh, there was some debate about whether attacks on fishing vessels were an actual fact a precursor event or an actual fact piracy. And there, the, the shipping industry thinks they're precursors because they don't think piracy takes place until you actually take one of the big ones. But also, uh, for example, in the Somali situation, the uh, illegal reported fishing, the uh, reported uh, dumping of toxic waste, a number of incidents which had taken place, all of which 
combined with the, uh, the breakdown of the Somali government could all be precursor events when you're, you're looking to a functional government falling down into a, a weakened state situation. So the, um, the kind of precursor events which we would be looking at would, for example, be, uh, in my opinion, like Syria. You've now got a refugee crisis in Syria. That is a potential precursor event that we've seen piracy follow refugees uh, in Somalia. We've seen it in the Gulf of Thailand. We've seen it in other places. So now we've got Syria with a refugee crisis. If I were in anti-piracy business, I would be looking at that very, very carefully to see um, what's going to happen because I don't think that you're going to see pirate gangs coming out of Syria attacking commercial vessels. What I do think you're going to probably see is going to be uh, individuals around that area, for example, beginning to target the, uh, the refugees and beginning to rob the refugees as they leave. So that's the kind of precursor event you want to look at. You want to look at where there's a breakdown because th the capabilities to, to deal with these things, you've got Department of Fisheries, you've got Coast Guard, you've got uh, environmental patrols, you've got all kinds of people out there looking for their problem. What we have to do is we have to get those people out there looking for other people's problem as well because when you start to identify, uh, yes, I'm uh, out there doing... Um, fisheries patrols, but boy, I've noticed an awful lot of smuggling going around here. Well, that may well be a kind of precursor activity. And it's something when I was teaching uh, enforcement, uh, we always used to remind uh, the uh, customs officers in a lot of jurisdictions. A customs officer, by law, is a fisheries officer in a lot of jurisdictions. His customs jurisdiction goes out to 12 miles or 24 miles to the edge of the zone for doing customs law. His authority as a fisheries officer goes out to 200 miles. He needs no uh, uh, excuse or no reasonable cause to board a fishing vessel to do an inspection to see whether they've got a license in doing illegal fishing. So don't say I said to do it, but if you happen to be out there and you see some ratty old fishing boat proceeding along the way and you're suspicious, you put on your fisheries officer's hat, go on board and say, where's your fishing license when you're in your gear? He says, I have none. Okay, into port. We'll do a detailed inspection. That's when you find the guns and the drugs. Okay? He hasn't violated any laws because he's doing it as a fisheries officer. And this is the problem when I said cooperation among states for piracy is really good. Cooperation among the bureaucracies within the state to suppress piracy is where a lot of the work has to be done. And that is why we don't need more law, we need more effective use of the ones that, uh, that we already have, which is echoing what uh, um, God, my previous speaker said as well. And my final question to Richard. Uh, Cesare Beccaria, the great Italian criminalist, uh, had the insight that criminals, two criminals. Uh, Ancora il suo nome? <laughs> Cesare Beccari. Grazie molto. Uh, two criminals. The length of prison terms matters less than the actual probability of getting caught. If, the puni if punishment is, is very severe, but the likelihood of getting caught is low, potential criminals will decide to commit crime. So authorities now focus more than ever on influencing the probability side, hence the greater monitoring. Uh, NSA spying, uh, stop and frisk measures in, in New York City, and the reduction of, of, of crime in general. Uh, your discussion talks about methods of detection through the financial system. They seem tried and uh, ineffective. Yet informal systems like Koala's uh, remain a, a challenge. If criminals react to these methods, how useful are they going to be in the long term if Koala's allow them to bypass the official banking system? Um, I'll answer the Hawala question first. The thing about Hawalas is that they're not part of the formal financial system. So the way Hawala works is that, you know, I have my cousin who lives in London, and uh, there are people who want to send money to the U.S., to the U.K., the U.K. to the U.S., and so because I can trust my cousin, well, okay, not my cousin, my friend who is in <laughs> London, and um, so somebody will give me some money, I pick up the phone and I say, okay, take the equivalent amount of, of money, cash, and give it to the recipient over there and vice versa. At the end of the month or the, maybe the week, we're going to have to consolidate and figure out, net out the transfers one way or the other and probably we'll actually have to use a bank, typically Hawala's do. So uh, use a bank, to or could even be a courier of cash. For, because if it turns out that more money was sent to London than here, there's going to have to be a little, uh, in consolidating the accounts, a little ship of cash over there. But it's still outside of the formal financial system. So if you're in a, in say with pirates again, particularly the ones who are, were making so much money out of ransoming in, on the Somali side of things, um, if you have excess cash that you can't just carry around in, in, in valises, um, 
and then invest that or buy something in Mayfair or in, in London, you still need to get it into the formal financial system and a hawala will not do that for you. So there has been an enormous amount of, of attention to hawalas, which I think is including by me back when I worked for the IMF, but I think it may have been over, overdone. The focus should be on where you can really grab um, cash in the formal financial system, which is the formal financial system and not outside of it. And that's what anti-money laundering rules were designed to do, to try to pretend that they're doing something else effectively, I think is wrong. Um, and going to your second or your first point about um, probabilities of being caught, um, and that's absolutely right. I actually wrote a book chapter on that very topic before any of you were you know, in grade school. It was so long ago, but I think the point is still correct. And there have been a lot of people who have written, including me, on the relative ineffectiveness of anti-money laundering laws when it comes to very sophisticated criminal schemes. My question here is, I, I don't think what's going on right now in piracy is particularly sophisticated with respect to the financing part or the getting the cash out. It's huge amounts of cash. And what's happened is the very simple rules have simply not been enforced. Number one, in, with respect to initial entry of the cash, into the banking system if it is in a local, if it's in Kenya, and I've actually worked on anti-money laundering in Kenya, they have not a bad system, but locally it's, just, it's very expensive for banks to implement these rules, and it's very difficult and expensive for local governments to enforce them. So giving more attention, um, and I would say more technical assistance, simply more cash for countries where the pirates are, are located, they're giving them more cash to help to enforce these rules is really what you need to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, three, for your wonderful answers. And now I open the floor to the audience. Professor Nanda. Well, thank you very much. I uh, get this off. Uh, Professor Gottlieb, you responded that um, maybe you ought to look at that broadly whatever is not, uh, that article brought, but whatever is not prohibited is permitted. Now, that is the old positivist approach. I think I would not probably go that there. But I would argue that anything you look at the law of treaties, whether it be the Vienna Convention or otherwise, you, you look at the object and purpose of the treaty. And if you look at the object and purpose of the treaty, then I think you don't need to construe that article very, very well. Agreed. <laughs> we have uh, one and a half more minutes, so uh, next. Doubt. Hi, I think it was Mr. Williamson. You said you were talking about the risk indicators. Yes. Um, human flight, and if I read correctly, brain drain. Yeah. Um, I understand the human flight, but could you please explain the brain drain? What uh, that is and. The brain drain component, uh, this is part of the human, I think, human development index, is uh, when the entrepreneur or the smartest and the brightest leave the country. And what we think might be the fact there is if your bright entrepreneurial types leave the country, what's left behind are uh, less uh, economic opportunities for people to be employed. So you're going to increase the unemployment, you're going to increase the uh, sort of the, the breakdown of the country, which again leads to a fertile environment for piracy. You've got unemployed youth who are looking around for something to happen. I've always figured, uh, I've been waiting for something to happen in Haiti. I think Haiti is the Western Hemisphere prime candidate for piracy. I think maybe the earthquake saved us in that so much humanitarian aid went in as a result that you know, all the other festering factors haven't come to fruition. But as the aid and as the international attention pulls out, you've still got poverty, you've still got access to uh, the sea, you've still got a high amount of unemployment, and you've got access to the boats and the, the, the equipment. So that would be, for example, some place that I would be keeping a very, very close eye on to, to see because you know, where are the brightest uh, and the best Haitians right now? They're not in Haiti. You know, they've all left. And so you're, you, you, you have to get into, you know, the, the solution to piracy is always a shore. If you want to stop a pirate attack, you do it at sea. If you want to stop piracy, you have to have a stable government ashore. And so building up some of these uh, basket gates states, states into a case where they can uh, start functioning again and providing economic opportunity is the solution. Well, this, is, this was the last question. Uh, I think our guests are going to be here a little bit more, but we have to wrap it up. A uh, round of applause to them. Thank you.
And thanks to you, Jusalim, as well, for um, your, your initial comments. Um, we're a break uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we will reconvene here at 3.30 for the final session. Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping you were actually going to get into the whole lot of things in a little bit more <laughs> detail, because that was something we actually had a... I didn't get to introduce myself. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah.